24TA, Trevaney Pumps USA. I work out of the Yorktown, Virginia office. Okay, uh, that's where these systems were manufactured. Okay, I have with me Chris Harris. Uh, I'm the electrical specialist. The electrical I do the wiring and testing commission. Basically, as I said earlier, this is a cross-sectional rendition of that pump that's sitting on the, the skid, okay? In the main components to a liquid ring vacuum pump, you have a shaft. On that shaft is an impeller, and you have a casing, okay? Outside of that, there's basically no other components, okay? Bearing, bearings, and seals. But other than that, there's no other basic components. If you notice, Inside, the blue is represented, that's the seal fluid. That's the sealing mechanism, okay, for the liquid ring vacuum pump. That impeller does not touch the casing, so there's no metal-to-metal -metal contact whatsoever on the inside of the pump. Get this to go. It starts to turn around, okay. When you were a kid, you had water in the bucket, you went this way, centrifugal force forces that water to the outer edges. That's where the seal is, okay, for the liquid ring vacuum pump. The actual operating area of a liquid ring vacuum pump is called the cell, and it is the area, it's a calculated area, in between two impeller blades, okay. Mother Nature, when you have expanding volume, what happens to pressure? It's around that area, those, that impeller gets shallower into the seal fluid, that volume increases, okay, pressure decreases, that's your suction side of the vacuum pump. Turn it on and it continues, that area gets deeper into the seal fluid, the opposite. When you compress, you get a smaller area, volume, smaller volume, what happens to pressure? It's the opposite, it, get, it increases. So that is basically the operation of a liquid ring vacuum. The carryover will saturate this filter inside and start losing performance. There is a back pressure gauge on here. If it gets above four PSI, you're pretty much knowing that your filter is ready to be changed. The filter and silence fil filters are just like your car filters. Now, the 4 PSI is that while it's running or while it's... While it's running. Yeah. Oh. Right. It's like a vacuum cleaner filter. Yep. That's pretty much all. It's like, just like a car. So, rubber piece off. These, you can wash this if it's new, especially on a new construction job like this. You'll get dust and stuff in there. Uh, this is just a paper line filter. We sell it and change them. I think it's recommended like once a year. Metal, metal mesh. Metal mesh filter, similar in design to this, but just larger scale. And what it does is it collects over uh, carryover oil when it, you go to shallow vacuum. Okay. And once it saturates, it can't pull exhaust the air through it. And then how do you clean that off? You have to unhook the uh, hose. You unhook the piping. Take the piping off. Undo the cap, and then it kind of come off. It comes out. And you put it in. And you uh, put a new one in, basically. Is that what yeah, you, you can put a new one in. It, that's again, what I was it's a to metal. Get it's a metal mesh. Uh, I do have have had people that will if they have a steam cleaner, they'll steam clean. It. Yeah. You don't have to coat it with oil or nothing like that, right? No, you don't want to coat it. With oil. No. That's the whole reason you're changing because it's, it's now been coated with oil and it won't draw through. How do you know when a filter needs to be changed? The back pressure gauge once it gets to four psi. Okay. And those small ones, he said once a year. Yeah, there's air inlet filters. <clears throat> this filter is the same design. It's an inlet filter. You can take it apart. You'll see, like where I was running yesterday, I pulled some little debris in and out of the piping. It collects it on the side. It's a matter of just popping these off, unscrewing the screw on the bottom, and change them out. Uh, this valve right here limits the vacuum. Vacuum relief valve. Uh, anytime you deadhead a pump, it'll cavitate. Cavitation will pit and wear out your impeller, cause long term damage. This is set at 28 inches, which is about a half inch before cavitation. So if you ever come up, 
this pump is cavitating, making a loud popping noise and stuff, it's cavitating. More than likely, this valve has gone bad. It's just a matter of putting a new one in there and setting it. This set screw can set it, it, it can be set anywhere from 20 to 28 inches, depending on the process you need. How do you set it? A pair of channel locks right. and a 7 16 wrench. You just hold it and tighten it. To go deeper, you tighten that? it. Yeah. No, I don't mean mechanically. I mean, how do you. Oh, you while the pump's setting, it? while the pump's running, just, you read it on the back of the gauge right here. You set it to whatever value you want. That pushes the oil out of the pump back into the reservoir to keep you from hard starting. It does not affect your process vacuum. Because when we're doing the shutdown, you still have vacuum on your system. There's a check valve here that opens and isolates this. So it's not you're not going to see a drop in your vacuum in your process. And again, change it once a year. There's a temperature gauge on the on the system, 140 to 170. Debris that's gotten past the filters and stuff like that. Or I have seen people that get a rag sucked up in there and it'll shred it. So you're using the radiator just to keep the oil at. The oil in that range, at that, the that temperature, temperature range. Yeah. It's a forced air. Right. It keeps it cold just like your car. Is the fan run all the time, or is it just fan, on the fan? The fan is on the shaft of the impeller or the pump, ah, so okay. it runs Whenever constantly. Whenever the pump's running, the fan's running. Smart. So we have shut the system down, some don't. There's an alarm on this system that tells you when the lag pump has turned on. It's more of an indication alarm to say you have a high demand vacuum right. draw, Something or a leak in your system because now, now I have a second pump running right. to keep up with demand. Can't make something. There is also a low vacuum point alarm. So if it gets to 20 inches, it knows something's really wrong. It's got a big leak somewhere. Hit alarm and that will shut the system off. It'll also sound the buzzer, flash a little to light up the top. Okay. The actual main low vacuum alarm like is, is like the buzzer, and that's. That buzzer or whatever. Right. Right. You're going to get an alarm when the second pump kicks on. It's just useless. It's just more of a. And it's. I'm going to turn this. Yeah, I'm turn this lag pump on. That's okay. persistent. If you're walking by, go, well, we, were in, we either got a leak or somebody's using a lot of that. Uh, transformer failure, it's an NFPA. Transformer fails, there's a backup inside it, it'll automatically switch over to it. This light will turn on and let you know that, hey, your main transformer has shut down. It's time you need to remove The system drawing with the BOM for all the parts in the drawing, okay, gives you the control panel schematics. Goes through the maintenance schedule, suggested maintenance schedule. One thing, Chris, we do offer once a year a service that if you have a question in regards to the oil, we can send you a vial and we can have the oil tested, okay? Uh, if it's necessary, okay? As suggested maintenance schedule, gives you a breakdown of the schematic and the internals of the va actual vacuum pump. Gives you the parts list for the system, suggested spare parts. We also provide all of the information in regards to the actual pump itself, uh, along with its parts list, <laughs> Performance curve, so if you're looking for data in regards to that, it's all here. What's telling the drive to ramp up and ramp down? Is that the the yeah. set point that's in the program mm -hmm. um, and the vacuum transducer that's on the back side of this tank. Okay, so it's and it's scaled to go from you know, 0 to 38 HP in vacuum. And the set point is 27, I think, is the max on the lead. It's set to go off of 27 or ramp down and 25, where the lag is 26 and 24. And that's, and the alarm, everything, the alarm set based off that transmission, when it, it thinks it's at 20 inches, it's gonna set the low vacuum. But that all goes to the PLC and then the PLC to the, to the uh, drive. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah, there's a direct connection, top, they, the drive top to the PLC and tell yeah. it what, okay. and it's a zero to 10 volt relationship with. Yeah. So, what Ray's asking that, so if these ever crap out, then we replace them with a different type of drive, then how would we you know, be able to connect them in? Yeah, it, this is a different type drive than normally that we normally use, but 
They're all pretty much the same. You'll, you'll set it up. There's a zero to ten volt reference that'll send to this to tell it, hey, go faster, go slower. The drive itself has a limit in it set to where no, don't turn down below 45 hertz because we'll lose our vacuum ring. But pretty much every VFD has this. So basically, you're just giving a drive a start, stop, and an analog input, and that's it. Yep. Okay. Any alarm points from the drive? Not from the drive itself. Okay. You do have a, a light here that says VFD failure. There is a, it's wired in there. If the VFD for some reason falls, it'll give you an alarm code. And I'll just light it, that up. It'll light that and it'll up if there's a fault. Typically you go in there and you hit the reset button. If that doesn't fix it, then you know you got a, a well, BFD issue. Wrong, or there's something going wrong with the motor or the motor. Right. Or it's just an indication. We try to put all the alarm indications on the front panel. Mm -hmm. Keep the user and layman person from going in here where there's four oh, yeah. in the degree. Oh, we got you. Can you reset it from the front panel, or, not? or do you have to open it up to reset it? You'll have to reset the VFD from inside the panel. Uh, typical conditions like high, low level mm -hmm. oil. Mm -hmm. You got a high level and a low level sensor on the tanks. High temperature alarm, if it sets off, it'll shut the system down for high temperature. As you can tell, the light level alarm came on because they, they opened up the whole building. So it's taking longer to get to it. After 10 seconds, it's like, hey, I'm not at the set point. I turned it on. It does sound the alarm. Oh, it's like a It, it still didn't take very, it took about 10 seconds longer than it did yesterday to do the whole building. It did like 45 hertz. If you want to hear the pump ramp up, I, the only way I got to do it now that it's installed is to drain on the tank. But it'll be really loud. But you can hear it ramp up. <laughs> you say 45 hertz? This is running at 45 hertz, which is just minimal. Typically, unless you got a lot of volume being pulled, this is what it's going to run like. Because we was pulling on the whole building to start up, the lag pump kicked on. Because after 10 seconds, it said, hey, I'm not here yet, I kicked it on. It really doesn't need to be on right now, but again, there's a 10 minute runtime. In 10 minutes, both of these systems are going to shut off. And it won't turn back on until it needs to. There's a, there's a bit of a demand, so the pump runs for 10 minutes and shuts off. Is there any lag time between when it's off and when it comes on again? It's 10 minutes. So it's got to be off for 10 minutes? No, no. Oh. no in, fact, in 10 minutes, I might turn off and all of a sudden somebody opens a big valve. But it's right. It'll turn right back on. But the 10 minute run time, that's how we do it, to limit it to six times starting and stopping an hour. But, you know, if it turns off, it's 9 o'clock at night, nobody's using vacuum. It's not going to turn back on until somebody starts using vacuum. But it starts back up, depending on how much it'll be at the BFD will ramp up its speed based on the band. If the lead pump can't handle it, it'll turn off the back. Okay, on this system, if they both turn on, if both of them are running, in that 10 minute time frame, you would, a lot of systems, this one would be at 60, and you would think this one would be somewhere else. Right. They equalize. So you might come up here and it's like both of them are running at 50 hertz. Because, hey, once I turned one on, I didn't need to run full speed. I throttled down and he throttled up. Shut off before the need if it needs to, or do they both run at 10 minutes and then it shuts off? Typically, with that 10 minute timer, the lead pump was on first, but the lag pump is going to turn on and it'll run for 10 minutes. But the lead pump is going to stay on as long as you not reach the max vacuum. Okay. I mean, why did the lead pump turn off before the lag pump? Well, that's because it 
Chris Heimer got started first. It finished its 10 minutes. And lag bumps 10 minutes, but then there was no demand, so this one was shut off. This one shut off. The timer is the ultimate deciding factor of whether it starts or stops.